Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Lakeshore Community Church. If you're out in the atrium, why don't you guys come on in? We're just about to get started here. If you're joining us online today, welcome to Lakeshore Community Church. So glad you guys are joining us from home. Uh, hey, it is a great day. Did it stop snowing? Yeah. That's a good thing, right? especially at the end of April. Hey, I just spent a whole week at Disney World. What an experience. It was the first time I was there as an adult, and it was a uh, trip of a lifetime for my family. And, and, and I was so impressed by the way that Disney World welcomes people and the, their, their, their guest services, right? You know the whole uh, be our guest, be our guest, put our service to the test? Man. They live that. It was so cool to experience that. And I kept thinking to myself, the church can learn from this. The church can learn from this. And I come back and today's message is all about how to treat people right. And I thought that that was so cool. So I hope you guys have been excited about this series we're doing on James. I've been excited. It's, it's really helped me in my walk with God. And uh, uh, we're going to continue it today. So why don't you guys stand up. While you're standing, our worship leaders are coming on out. Danielle, Wendy, Stacy, and Delisa. And why don't you guys take a moment and turn to one another and give each other a warm welcome today. Good morning once again. It's so great to have you here this morning. We're going to start our worship with praising God for the grace he gives us. It is unearned. It is undeserved, but he pours it on us over and over. Aren't you thankful, church? You have brought me to the water where my past can be swept away in the current of your mercy. And I know I'll never be the same. There's no limit to your promise. Jesus, you have done it all for me. Jesus, you have done it all for me.
morning. Crash over me. There's healing in the water with a love that flows so deep. Wash over me, wash over me. Forgiveness in the water with a love that flows so deep. Wash over me, wash over me. We receive it. Salvation in the water with a love that flows so deep. Wash over me, wash over me. Fortune lies beyond the stars Those dazzling heights too vast to climb I got so high to fall so far That I found heaven as love swept low My heart beating, my soul church when we lay down our lives and surrender that's when we truly live our life come on let's sing this out what treasure waits within your scars this gift of freedom gold can buy i bought the world and sold my heart you traded heaven to have me
you know, I think we all go through different seasons in life, and I'm not sure what you're walking in here with today, but I think that we often take it, the control in our own hands, and we try to fix and overcome the darkness in our lives that we're going through. But really, there's only one person that can truly overcome anything in your life, and that's Jesus. And his very name is powerful. And if you don't really understand why his name is powerful, let me tell you, it is because he overcame death on the cross, and he raised from death to life. And he raises us from our death to life when we surrender our lives to him. So I don't know if right now you're struggling with darkness of fear, of illness, of relational loss. I don't know what that is for you, but I can tell you that Jesus can overcome that. He already has, and we have access to that power. And when we access him, we access his light. I don't know if anyone knows this, but if you ever thought about it, light next to darkness, light always wins. It always wins. So the way that we engage the light is we spend time with him in the word, the Bible. We pray and we engage in worship like we are right now. So we're going to claim that light. And we're just going to claim that the darkness in our lives are going to tremble at his name, at the name of Jesus. We're going to sing this together. This is a new song. The words are up on the screen. But we're just going to sing this as a prayer. And we're going to proclaim that this morning. Storm surrounding me, let it break at your name. Still, call the sea to still, the rage in me to still, every wave at your name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, breathe, call these bones to live, call these lungs to sing once again, I will pray. Yeah. 
us, Jesus. You silence our fears, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. is quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice, and seas that are shaken and stirred, can be calmed and broken for my regard. Soul and trust. 
my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well oh love and through it all through it all my eyes are on you and it is well Father God, we just praise you for this time together where we can claim, we can claim your truth, Father. We thank you for conquering the darkness, Father. We thank you for being our light, for your perfect gift of perfect love. And for those who are walking with you in your son's name, we just praise you for letting our souls find rest in you. No matter what we're facing, whether it's a joyful moment or a moment of pain or heartache, we know that when we walk in Christ's name, that we can find peace and comfort in him. Not that it's going to be okay or that it is okay, whatever we're walking through, but that our souls are, are going to be with you eternally, and in that we can find our peace. Father God, I pray that our ears... And our hearts are open to hear your truth through Pastor Vince's message this morning. And I thank you and praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Thank you, Wendy, for praying us out of the worship set. As we come out of that, I just want you guys to think about two words, discover and develop. What does it mean to discover a relationship with Jesus Christ? And what does it mean to develop that relationship? And that's why Lakeshore exists. And I hope that worship time was a time of discovery for you. Maybe discovering what it means to have a relationship with Jesus for the first time. Learn something new about Jesus through that worship time. And, discover, and, and develop is, is where Lakeshore can come in and, and help you folks grow in your faith. And that's why we exist here. And I want to encourage you, after service, you hear us talk about the Get Connected area. It's right out the auditorium off to the left, and that's where people are waiting there to help you figure out what are the next steps to help you grow in your faith. And maybe your steps are different than, than somebody else's steps, but they wanna help you figure that out. And, and I wanna highlight one uh, step today. Um, if you wanna go beyond Sundays, we have an event on Thursdays called Common Ground. We meet on the first and third Thursdays. It's a midweek Bible study. We're currently in a series right now called Life Foundations. You could jump in at any time. There are, there are individual messages. You're not gonna miss anything by jumping in at this stage in the game. I wanna encourage you to join us on Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, right here for Common Ground. Uh, in the seat back in front of you is a connect card. It looks like this. And if you're online, uh, there's a link that you can click on and our moderator online will help you figure out where that is. Uh, you can jot down some contact information on here. Maybe you want to learn more about some of the classes that we offer. Uh, maybe uh, you've got a prayer request. Maybe you've got a question about Lakeshore. Uh, put it on the, the Connect card, and later on in the service, when we receive our offering, you, you can drop it in the offering basket, and uh, we'll be sure to uh, get back to you regarding your question. Uh, well, today we are continuing in our series on the book of James. I don't know about you guys, but it's been real helpful for me personally. And today, uh, in a few moments, Pastor Vince will be coming up, and he's going to be sharing with us how to treat people right.
Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. 200 faces, all of them different. Can you believe you saw just 200 faces right there? What do you see? <clears throat> Every morning you come to church, uh, you see hundreds and hundreds of faces, all different. What do you see? Every single day, uh, you see and engage of lots of people. You see them, but what do you see in them? How do you think about them? How do you treat them? That's what I want to talk about. That's what James is going to talk about as we continue our series in the book of James of Faith That Works. So take out your notes, and now we're in the second chapter of James, James chapter 2. <clears throat> and the whole thrust of the book of James is that we have a faith that works. Faith, you become a Christian by faith alone, but genuine faith is never alone. It's always accompanied by a change in behavior and good works. Good works don't make you a Christian. They are the fruit of being a Christian. They're not the root of being a Christian. Faith alone is. But if you're someone who has put your faith alone in Jesus Christ that way, it's an important proof of your faith to see people's faces the right way and to treat them right. And no matter if, if you're a Christian or not today, it's still important. You work with different people. You live with and near different people. You spend most of your time around people. And the truth of the matter is you depend on people. Yeah, you got to borrow a, a, some sugar. You got to borrow a tool. But we all depend on people a lot more than what we think. And the way we treat them has a real, real strong impact on how meaningful our life is, how significant our life is, and all of that. So this is why James, I think, the writer, author, who bears his name on the book, feels a sense of urgency in addressing this topic. And he deals with this question. Different faces, what do you see? So notice how he begins. He starts with just the, in verse 1, the overarching idea, and then he's going to unpack it in the 12 verses that follow. He says this, As believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, let's stop right there, and let's not blow by that, that Jesus Christ is so glorious. He's way better than we ever think and we ever know. And I hope you know that. Whatever you think of Jesus Christ, he's greater than that. You think he's great, he's greater than that. You think he's greater than that, he's greater than that. He's the Lord of glory, the glory of God, the splendor of Jesus Christ is incredible. He says, believers in that glorious Lord, you must never treat people in different ways according to their outward appearance. Now the word, the phrase in different ways is actually one word in Greek, comes from two different words, a compound word that has two different Greek words behind it. It literally means to receive by face. James is saying, never treat people and receive them by faith. In other words, don't, you ever heard the expression, face value? Don't judge people by face value. It has the idea that you base how you treat someone just on how you see them on the outside. And he says, according to their outward appearance. Now, the truth is, we all judge people on their outward appearance and at a certain level, listen to me, at a certain level, it's normal and healthy and right. That's called discernment. If you go into a tricky, tough situation, and you're not sure if it's safe, are you, is that wrong? No, that's called discernment. That's important. You need to show discernment. But James isn't talking about discernment here. He's talking about judging on outward appearances in a negative way. He's talking about discrimination. When you judge outward appearances to discern the safety, security, the rightness, the wrongness of a situation, that's discernment, that's good. He's not talking about that. Here he's talking about discrimination. It's judging outward circumstances in a negative, uh, degenerative, uh, horrendous way. And that's called discrimination. So let's look at dealing with discrimination in James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. There are lots of other words for discrimination. Favoritism, prejudice. What is prejudice? Break it down. Prejudge, prejudice, prejudgment. And then judgmentalism. They're all synonyms, synonyms for this very same word. And James is going to help us see the problems with discrimination in the next few verses, and then he spends more time on the solutions. Now, our world is so divided today, isn't it? Our country is so divided by race, politics, government, our view of the police, views on immigration. We're divided and discriminated by neighborhoods, by gender. And the only hope for change in this is right here in a church. Not just our church, but the church. 
It's only when people who love God lead the way are we going to change. And my question throughout this message is, are you going to be the change the world needs to see? So here's the problems with discrimination. James begins with an illustration that really hits home with his audience because it was a common occurrence. And subtly, and and, in many ways, we see it so clearly and we do the same thing. He says, suppose... That means it's an illustration. It didn't really happen. But he says, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not, here's our word, discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. And in Greek, there's no implied answer, there's a demanded answer. And the answer is yes, of course you have. See, the only difference between the first and the second person is their outward appearance and their clothes. It was more common in James' day, but it happens still today. And he says this, if you show special attention, in Greek, it literally means to gaze upon. If you just gaze upon people, It has the idea that you just take a quick glance on the outside and all of a sudden you you think you know everything about them on the inside. Special attention. It's pretty clear and obvious what the illustration is saying, and it's very easy to understand, yet we all struggle with it as easy as it is to understand. Now here's the challenge. All the research shows, this is a fact, all the research shows this. When you meet somebody, within seconds, within seconds, you are instantly forming opinions of that individual. Instantly. Not, all, not like, well, if you're bad, this happens. No, it's not if you're bad. It's not if you're good. It's just if you're alive. We all do this. We all instantly form opinions of people the moment we see them. We're, we're looking at their face, looking at their clothes, looking at the way they talk, looking at their expressions, and we're forming opinions that are both strong and lasting according to all the research. This is natural. Nobody should get after you for this. But what James is going after is when these natural assumptions, like concrete, dry and harden and firm up before they should. You know, when concrete is forced to dry too quickly, it's weak and anemic. And when we get these opinions, which we are all going to have instantly, and we get the concrete to dry and harden quickly, that's called discrimination. And when we quickly say in five seconds, you're this, you're that, you're this, I know exactly what you're about, then you've gone into the unfair and discriminatory. Now, what's the problem with discrimination? I think in that last verse, verse 4, there's three phrases I think help us see the problem. First, discrimination is deeply divisive. Notice what he says. He says, have you not discriminated? The literal Greek word has the idea of divided thoughts. Don't you have divided thoughts? James referred to the same word in James 1.6 where he says a double-minded person. Remember that? A double-minded person. Yes, no, here, there. A double-minded person is unstable in all his ways. Did you like that? That was pretty good, I thought. <laughs> Felt like I had a hula hoop around me. He's saying our tendency is to have divided thoughts because of our sinfulness, and this leads to divided people. Divided thoughts lead to divided people. And so much of what divides us today starts with faulty preliminary thinking about people. When we, and this is human nature too, and again, it can be good, but it's also bad at times. We tend to categorize people. Those inner city people. All African Americans do this. All Asian people are smart. White men are the problem. Rich people in Pittsburgh are snobs. These kinds of things. And it divides us. We laugh because we know that there are some snobs in Pittsburgh, but they're not all snobs. (laughs) Just just some. See how easy it is? It's just so easy. And we lose the beauty of diversity. Second, discrimination, second problem is, is personally prideful. Have you not discriminated, watch this, 
amongst yourselves. I circled amongst yourself. I circled prideful, which is the, one of the words you wrote in, and I drew a line between them. One of the reasons we discriminate is to put down others. And you know why we put down others sometimes? To lift ourselves up. And usually narcissistic people, self-absorbed, insecure people are the best candidates to do this. We put other people down so that we can falsely build ourselves up. But it's a house of cards. It doesn't work. Some people can't build themselves up without having to tear somebody down. There's a classic sitcom where the patriarch, who's a known kind of judgmental racist, of course, it portrayed white men negatively, which sadly is an occurrence, and other people are portrayed negatively in TV, but white men are particularly portrayed as um, jerks um, for whatever reason. And the patriarch of the family was accused of being prejudiced. He goes, I am not prejudiced. I hate everybody, <laughs> is what he said. And it's personally prideful. Here's the third problem. Discrimination is judgmentally unjust. He says, haven't you become judges with evil thoughts? In other words, we're unjust in judging. Now, in the New Testament, judging can be good and bad. You ever heard of this one? Like maybe you're, if you're a Christian or somebody knows you go to church, and they're doing something that's way out of bounds, way, way wrong, and you say, hey, that's wrong. And what do they say? Hey, man, don't judge me. Don't, you ever hear that? And you're going... So, like, can you judge people? Yes and no. Because here's the thing. In the New Testament, there's a good use of judging and there's a bad use of judging. Can I give you the example? Here's the good use of judging. Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5, says this. It's my understanding that there's a person in your church who's sleeping with his stepmother. Not good. Paul says, what that person is doing is wrong. And Paul said this. I have already judged that person. That's bad judgment. And then Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, 1, do not judge lest you be judged. <laughs> Paul, don't say that, Paul. Jesus said you shouldn't do that, Paul, but you're doing it because they're talking about two different things. There's two different words for judgment in the New Testament. What's Paul saying? Paul is rendering a verdict on the obvious. That's good judging. If I see somebody molesting a child, I'm not judging. I'm rendering, a ver in a negative way, I'm rendering a verdict on the obvious. That's good judgment. That's Paul's judgment. Jesus said, Don't, do not judge lest you be judged. What's he talking about there? That's assigning a motive to a behavior. That's bad judgment. I know exactly why you did that. You have a dark heart. You did that for this reason. And as pastors, we get this all the time, but you probably do too. People assign motives to everything. We do this because, and that's bad judgment because the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know? You don't even know your own heart. Now, somebody else who doesn't even know you is going to tell you they know your heart too. That's bad judgment. Somebody uh, gave me a reference, John 7, 30-something, 30 34-something, where Jesus says, uh, judge with just judgment. What's he saying there? There's a good way to judge, and there's a wrong way to judge. But here James is dealing with the second kind, the bad kind, of, or the, 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 yes, the second kind that Jesus refers to. It's discrimination. It's playing the role of judging people in ways that only God can and only God should. One person said, prejudice is being down on someone you're just not up on. One person said, discrimination really saves a lot of time. It helps you form opinions without bothering to get the facts on people. Another person said it succinctly. Prejudice is a people poison. It's a people poison. So discrimination deeply divides, it's personally prideful, and it's judgmentally unjust. How do we pull out of discrimination? How do we combat it? What are the solutions to discrimination? Well, in the rest of the passage we're going to look at this morning, verses 5 to 13, James is going to give us four ways to treat people right. The solution to discrimination, treat people right. Treat people right. Just treat them right. You treat people right, discrimination won't be a problem. 
So let me give you four key decisions you and I have to make. Number one, value every person just like God does. Stop seeing people through the prism of prejudice. Start seeing people the way Jesus Christ sees people. James brings a reminder through a series of four questions in verses 5 to 7. He says, listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he has promised those who love him? There's the first question. Let's stop right there. When, when, G, when James says, has not God chosen the poor in the, this world, think of poor as having quotes around it. He's not necessarily talking about financial poverty, although that may be included in the group. He's talking about poor. In other words, poor, quote unquote, in the eyes of the world. In other words, people look down upon you. People say this about you. People say that about you. You're poor. In 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 2, Paul says, there are not many of you that were financially rich, not many of you who are this, not many of you are successful, not many of you are this and that, not many of you were the cream of the crop. You know why? Because people, he's not saying that rich people can't be Christians. I know lots of people that are Christians that are rich. He's just saying there's not many of them. Because you know why? Because what he's saying is people who are quote-unquote poor have been beaten up in life, have been challenged in life, have been hurting in life. And they can't handle it. And they go, where do I turn? And Jesus Christ, the love of Jesus Christ pops into their life. They see it and smartly they grasp onto it. But the quote unquote rich people, what do they say? I got everything I need. I got everything I want. I don't need God. That's what they say. They pretend that their life is a mighty fortress. It's built up and I don't need God. And that's the point. The point is not how much money you have, it's how much money has you. It's not how, how successful you are, it's how much success has you. And what he's saying is the poor people who realize, man, I can't make life work apart from God. Oh, Jesus Christ, he's the answer, thank you. I cling to that. But other people go, I don't need God, I don't need Jesus. Jesus is for weaklings. It's for chumps. It's for toad brain people. People who need help. Jesus is a crutch. Yeah, the best crutch you'll ever find. And we all got a broken leg. And that's the truth. So he's saying that. Now he makes a contrast. He goes, but you, circle God in the first uh, verse, and then circle but you. There's the contrast. God does it right. But you have insulted the poor. It is not the rich who are, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Demanded answer, Yes. Are they not the ones who are dragging you to court? Yes, they are. Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? James is pointing out the irony of favoring the very people who oppose God, all because they have an outward appearance, all because you've decided, not you, but, but, but in this illustration, decided to discriminate against people. Here's the point. Start to see the people, like the first part of this passage, the way God does. Not the last part of the passage, as mother, many other people do. Now, how does God see people? Can I give you a couple ways? Number one, God sees people and he never discriminates against them. Romans 2.11 says, even though God has a distinct plan for the nation of Israel, and I'm pro-Israel, by the way. It doesn't mean I'm anti-Arab. I love all people. But I'm pro-Israel because God has a future plan for them. Even though God is pro-Israel, even though God has a future plan for Israel, guess what? Romans 2.11 says he doesn't discriminate between Jew and Gentile. Just because he's got a special plan for Israel doesn't mean he likes Jews more than Gentiles. Another example that God doesn't discriminate, Ephesians 6.9, God doesn't show favoritism, masters over slaves. Colossians 3.25, God doesn't show favoritism in judging anyone and what's right and wrong. Oh, for, for you, I really like you, so we're going to have this standard. Oh, for you, you're not so cool. You got this standard. No. God has the same standards. God does not play favorites. That's how God sees people. Neither should we. Second, God sees every person as bearing his image and likeness. That's a reference in your notes, James, Genesis 1.27. God has made every human being in his image and his likeness. It doesn't matter what disabilities you have, physiological, emotional, mental. Every human being equally bears the image of God. It doesn't matter. You don't even have to believe in God. You bear the image of God equally like a person who's loved Jesus Christ most of their life. 
Every human being bears the image of God. You know what that means? Every human being deserves dignity and respect. And if you don't treat every human being with dignity and respect, even our worst enemies, which is the greatest proof, people who don't believe in God and mock us out. And James says if, you, if, if God sees people this way, so should we. And if we want to treat people right, that's what we have to do. You know why? Because when God sees a valueless person, he says, you have value to me. Let's change this right now. When God sees a rejected and poor person, he says, you're accepted with me. Come to me, all who are weak and weary and sick and tired of this life, and I'll give you rest. When Jesus Christ sees the downtrodden, he says, come to me, and I'll lift you up and I'll give you victory, and you'll be more than conquerors through me. We need to look past the outside and see people just like God does. You know, a few weeks ago, we just celebrated, uh, celebrated is probably the wrong word. We remembered the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And that's a very important day, a very, very, very important day in the history of this country. And what made Do the reverend, because he was a pastor, the reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. effective was his use of biblical vision and biblical principles and how he acted. I hope you know that. I mean, you may not have learned that in school, but he was the Reverend Dr. King. He practiced the Bible. I hope you know that. It wasn't just secular. Not a chance. And in his famous I Have a Dream speech, which he wrote on August 28, 1963, I very I highly encourage you to read it. I think one of the things that you ought to do is read some of the great statements. When President Kennedy said it would be the first country to put a man on the moon, what a visionary statement. Dr. King's statement, the Gettysburg Address, so many other great statements. And what he did was the genius of Dr. King was how he used the biblical idea of seeing people the way God does to help us overcome the evilness and the sinfulness and the godlessness of racism. Listen to some of these quotes. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. What a godly biblical statement. You see how he's seeing people the way God does? Let me lift this next statement. Little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. Every time I see at the mall or at the store or playground little black children, little white children, or people of different races, it's like, oh, thank God they haven't been exposed to stupid thinking on this. It's so biblical. And then King said, this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's uh, pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring, and if America is to be a great nation, we must make this true. And that is so biblical. Why? Because Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision was that that we would all see each other the way God sees us. The way God sees us. How about you? Are you seeing people the way God sees people? Or are you engaged still in discrimination? Here's the second. The key decision, second key decision, treat people right, overcome discrimination. Treat every person just like you'd want to be treated. Simple. So simple. James 2.8, if you really keep the royal law, this is called the royal law, found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. The royal law, love your neighbor as yourself. There's two great things, the, the royal law and the golden rule. Golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The royal law, love your neighbor as yourself. This is taught by Jesus in the New Testament. I'm sure James knew this in, in uh, Matthew 22, 39. By the way, it's taught, taught in the Old Testament. Did you know that? Love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19, 18. Oh, that can't be true because God, God was mad in the Old Testament and then he calmed down in the New Testament. That's silly. <laughs> That's so silly. That's, you never hear people, God was, 
judgmental in the Old Testament. And then Jesus calmed him down. No, no. God was gracious in the Old Testament. Jesus turned over the tables twice. So God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, no, no matter the Testament. Every time you face a person and you feel the urge to prejudge them, just ask yourself this question. Would I want to be viewed that way? Like, would I want to be viewed that way? Would that be love if I did that? Can I tell you what the answer to treating people right is? It's the ultimate answer what James is saying. Just love people. Isn't that what you want from people? Don't you want to be loved and respected? It solves all the problems we face. You know what? This, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what your relationship is with anybody. You know what the secret to knowing to <laughs> let's give you the answer. You know what the secret to loving people is? Knowing them. When you know people, then you love them. Because it's easy to not love somebody you don't know. That person over there. But when you get to know them, you start to love them. I mean, really know them. In in the fall of 1989. God miraculously and sovereignly helped me meet Bill Smith, an African-American pastor who moved from Buffalo to go to Dallas Seminary. And uh, I moved, you know, I was from Rochester. I was born and raised here, if you don't know that. And then when I graduated with my electrical engineering degree in 85, moved to Florida, then moved to Dallas. And, we, and I said, hey, I'm from Rochester, We're from Buffalo. We became great friends. And God sovereignly helped me meet Bill Smith. Because guess what? I met him, and he had such a gentle spirit, still has. He's a beautiful person. He pastors North Buffalo Community Church in, um, on uh, Kenmore Drive Boulevard, whatever it's called in Buffalo. Great church there. And I began to get to know Bill, and I began to love him. I mean, David and Jonathan, godly brother-to-brother -brother love. And as I began to know him and love him, and he told me about the plight of being African-American in America, I believed it because I got to know and love him. And thank God that starting in 1989, I saw the race issue right and not in the shallow, stupid, superficial way I had seen it before then. And when you love your neighbors yourself, God's going to give you a Bill Smith and he's going to help you understand an issue some issue that you have discrimination on. And if you have the courage to know and love somebody, they're going to wake you up. You're going to be woke in a good way. So just put yourself in someone else's shoes. Get to know them, and you're going to better be able to love them. And you won't discriminate against them. Are you willing to get outside your comfort zone and get to know people who are unlike you? I encourage you to do it. It may be awkward, clumsy at first. In the long run, you'll thank God the moment you, you thank God for the very moment it began. And it doesn't have to be race. It can be socioeconomic. It can be whatever. It's why I love West Ridge Elementary School and our relationship with them. Because even in our town of Greece, we have people that are socioeconomically challenged. And we go and love them. Man, it's powerful powerful and you'll find it easier to love people when you get to know them here's the third key decision to make and that's this see every person just like an opportunity and if you want you can write next to this and not an obstacle james is going to show us that every time we encounter people we have a choice see them as an obstacle or as an opportunity. Look at what it says. He says, But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking all of it. And he gives an example. For he, that's God, that's why I left the capital H, for he, God, who, it's for he who said, that is God, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you become a lawbreaker. In other words, you don't have to break the entirety of the law to be a lawbreaker. You just break it one time. You're guilty of breaking the whole law. 
Now watch the contrast. That's seeing people as an obstacle. Now James is going to say, instead see people the right way as an opportunity. Look at what he says in the last verse. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. What is he talking about? There's two laws at, at work. In the first part of the passage, it's the Old Testament law of morality issued through Moses. In the second part, the good part, it's the New Testament law of grace and freedom instituted by Jesus Christ. The first Old Testament law is helpful and important. It tells us how to live, tells us how to love ourselves and others, and it tells us about God's holy character. But you know what else it does? It tells us you can't keep it. You, did you know that? One of the whole purposes of the Old Testament law, you know what it is? To show you you can't keep it. Why? To show yourself that you cannot save yourself. You can't get right on your own. The second law that he's referring to, the law that gives freedom, is the New Testament law, and it's essential, and it determines our relationship with God, whether or not we have one with him and whether or not we're going to heaven or hell when we die. The second law starts by helping us understand we can't keep the whole law. We always fall short. But God offers freedom to those who fail without condemnation. And when we embrace that freedom that only Jesus Christ exclusively offers us through his death, burial, and resurrection, then we experience the law of freedom. And what's he saying? Speak and act to those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Stop treating people like they're in the Old Testament. And start treating people like they're in the New Testament of grace and mercy and forgiveness. A number of years ago, I read a book. It's a good book, simple, basic, good, called Top Ten Mistakes Leaders Make by Hans Finzel. And the different chapters were titled, The Different Mistakes People Make. And one of the chapters was entitled, Putting Paperwork Before People Work. And I remember reading that chapter, and I go, and I had, and I had been like, I can't, meet, I can't, I can't, I can't. And, and all I was doing was task, 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 paper, 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 email, email, email. And I read that chapter and I felt so bad. <laughs> I remember, I just, I just said, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to call somebody and feel better. Hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Hey, I just engaged some people. You know why? Because paperwork is a means to an end. You know what the end is? People work. Paperwork is not as important as people work. And you know what? Only one of them is eternal. I know you think that pile on your desk will never go away. It's semi-eternal, but it's not eternal. People are. When you see people who have been discriminated against, listen to them. Don't just blow them off. When people need your help, help them. When people need a few minutes, give them a few minutes. I understand I'm busy, you're busy, I get all that. So maybe you can't give them 20 minutes. Maybe you can't give them 10 minutes. Can you give them five? Can you? You can. God will make it up. It's too easy to focus on tasks over people. And when Jesus fed the 5,000, he knew exactly what was in their hearts. Their, you know what their hearts were? Every time we get around Jesus, we get a bunch of food. Jesus is better than the Paolo Bakery. So we're going to follow Jesus. So the Bible says he, went, he got in a boat on the other side, and they all, all were waiting for him. Hey, Jesus, don't smell anything. You baking any bread today? And Jesus says, I know why you're following me. Because you just want a happy meal. He says, I still love you anyway. And I know some of you will believe and some of you won't. Jesus in his om omniscience knew everything. He said this, but if you do come to me, I'll never drive you away. If Jesus Christ says, if you come to me, I'll never drive you away, who are we to think we're so big and mighty that we don't have time for people? See people as opportunities, opportunities to build into, opportunities to encourage, opportunities to help somebody. Share in their success, teach them, love them. When you do this, you'll overcome the division that exists. Don't see people as obstacles. Father took his son fishing on a Saturday. He was so, so busy. They each had a journal. A father wrote in his journal, went fishing with my son. It was okay, but I didn't get any work done. 
a day wasted. Little boy wrote in his journal, went fishing with my dad today. It was awesome. Caught some fish. Just being with my dad, best day of my life. And sometimes the very day we think is quote-unquote wasted because we built into somebody else is the very day God says, best day you've had in a long time. We can impact people when we encounter them and see them as an opportunity to love. I need to hear that. One more. Offer every person mercy just like God did. James ends the section by saying that extending mercy to others is always triumphant over judging them. James 2.13, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. You know that? God says, oh, you're unmerciful to people? Okay, I'll just use that as the standard for judging you. God doesn't want that for you. You, don't, you shouldn't want that for you. Instead, he offers this. He says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Positively, he says, we should have mercy on others, just like God has mercy on us. Ephesians 4.32, forgive as God in Christ forgave you. When you feel an urge to judge, to discriminate against other people, just remember this. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What if you were the minority? What if you were born in a different zip code? What if you were poor? What if you were judged? What if you were a race which wasn't popular in a culture? What if you were treated poorly on a regular basis? What an awesome feeling it would be to have somebody love you and come alongside you, put their arm around you and go, I understand. I don't like it either. I'm with you. I love you. We're going to get through this together. It's not right. I care about you. It's what God does. You go, I never felt God's arm around me. Well, if you're a Christian, you're not going to feel God's arm around you. You're going to feel, feel his love in you because he lives in you. And if you're not a Christian, that's what you can have. You can have the love of God living in you, encouraging you. And God will do it, but how much better when God does it and God's people also do it, also show love. It's even better. Awesome feeling it would be. Mercy always wins. So as I wrap up, treating people right means that we value every person like God does, treat every person just like you'd want to be treated, see every person as an opportunity, not an obstacle, and offer every person mercy just like God did for us. Every single day, we're going to see hundreds and hundreds of people. How will we see them? How will we value them? How will we treat them? Will we treat them right? We can be the model, the example in our world for racial reconciliation, for not being judgmental, for caring for the less fortunate, by lifting up people with disabilities, by loving other people that others just can't, don't, and won't. And our world is so messy and divided today, so messy and divided, and they do not have the answers. CNN does not have the answers, and if you're a conservative, neither does Fox. You know why I know they don't have the answers? Because what's their answer to the problem? Destroy property, smash windows, break laws, steals, riot in non-peaceful ways. And worst of all, they return hate for others. We've forgotten the genius of Martin Luther King Jr. when he says, when we respond to evil with evil, we have become just like the perpetrators. But the church has an opportunity to be the light of the world when it comes to treating people right. We can show the world, Lakeshore Community Church and every church in Rochester and every church in America and every church in the world that believes the Bible can show the world how to do it right. I am 100% convinced no one can be, dissuade me from this. If the church cannot get this right, no one else will. I'm telling you. It's got to start here. Look at the diversity that the Lord God has given our church. I love it. I love it. I thank God that we have age diversity, gender diversity. We have more and more African Americans coming. I love it. 
more Hispanic people. I love it. More people that are diverse. I love it. It makes our church so much better. The ground is 100% level at the cross, and that's what the church has got to be. If we get to know more people at Lakeshore who are different than us, then we're going to love them. And we're going to be a light to the world. The great church father, Tertullian, who was examining Christianity, wasn't sure about it. He was outside, and he saw a church meeting break up, and he saw this love that the Christians had. He says, Tertullian said, behold how these Christians love one another. And he became a Christian because of it. And we can model it too. So will you treat people right? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, please forgive us please forgive us for not treating people right. We all have done it. I know I have done it, Lord. Please forgive me. And if anybody else feels that they've done it, please forgive them. It starts with discrimination and it ends with doing what you would want us to do. Loving people that way. If you are already a follower of Jesus Christ, It's high time you start living this non-discriminatory approach that you take the initiative to love people who are on the wrong side of the uh, teeter-totter of life. And if you are not yet a Christian, my humble opinion, you don't have the power to not discriminate fully. Because when Jesus Christ comes into your life, he'll change you, he'll take away all discrimination, and guess what happens? You start going, oh my goodness, if it wasn't for God's grace, I wouldn't be anything. So you know what? I'm going to be a person of grace. I'm not going to be a divider. I'm going to be a uniter. Satan is a divider. God is a uniter. And I'm going to be a uniter. Father, for anybody who says they need Jesus Christ, right now help them see their need to have their sin forgiven. Help them see that Jesus Christ is the only answer. And if that's you, friend, just say, Jesus, come into my life. You're holy. I'm sinful. You rose. I need you. Father, forgive them now. Forgive all of us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Hope to see you Thursday at Common Ground at 7. We talk about demons, the evil angels. It'll be a fascinating study. Thanks. Have a good afternoon.